Hello and welcome to another Deep Away Dialogue. I'm Richard Cox, here with Tim Freak, and today we're going to be talking about mindfulness. Tim, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm just being very mindful here as we're starting Are off. Are you a mindfulness teacher, Tim? Is that, that Am I a mindfulness teacher? Yeah. Um, no, uh, in that uh, I, don't, I don't call it mindfulness. Um, I teach meditation as part of an overall... Uh, desire to share a new a more awake state of consciousness so mindfulness i think well the, no, the, the first thing is what do you mean by mindfulness because mindfulness yeah. now has become a very popular thing um, it's introduced a lot of people to a form of meditation when i practiced mindfulness i was doing it in a buddhist context it was 30 plus years ago more than that now um, and it wasn't necessarily the same thing so all of that has played into my journey and has helped create create the deeper weight practices for sure yeah so it's come to be very much meaning around awareness of the present moment yeah so taking one's awareness out of the consuming and circulating thoughts in the mind and coming into the senses yes so first the first thing to note with what you just said that's exactly right it's talked about as being in the present moment but what it isn't actually about being in the present moment what it's actually about is the senses because when people say come into the present moment what they really mean is nothing to do with the present moment because there is no other place you can be so you could is that it, it's it's purely that you move your attention into your senses is a much more accurate description of what people are being asked to do so with mindfulness like on the classic new mindfulness courses they give you a uh, i believe i haven't done it but i know people who have they give you like a raisin and you study the raisin and what it looks like and you're conscious of it and you you really go into it and that's what i call deep sensing and I, the, other, the other phrase I use, which is taken from Zen, is entering. You come right into your senses. So most of the time, we are pay attention to the psyche, to the soul, to the imagination. And we do that because it's the most interesting thing that's going on. It's marvelously interesting. We're in it now. The problem is, it's like everything in life, it's ambiguous. It's not just one thing. It's got a positive side. It's got a negative side. And the negative side is we all get caught up in repetitive thoughts and anxiety and and sometimes, a lot, actually, people, that can be a very unpleasant experience. So what mindfulness does and why it's become so popular is it says, take your attention from that and bring it into this. And that's one half of what I teach in my deep awake meditation. It's come out of that and come into this. So in, and in so doing, this starts to calm down and it's, you're no longer dominated by uh, unpleasant, repetitive thoughts. You can actually allow that to calm and, and, and be creative, for instance. Okay, I had to say, um, I was initially a bit cynical of mindfulness when I first, when I bought my first book on meditation. Okay, so I, the reason I bought it, I'd had these spontaneous awakening experiences, which I, I've written a bit about, where I would just go around in this blissful state for a day. And I had this, I think I, I slotted that into a slightly Christian context and said, I just got this, I just know heaven exists and there's much more to this world. and. I would go around appreciating the sense of one life force bringing the grass and the trees and my dogs and myself to life. And it was all very beautiful. Didn't know where to go with that or how to pursue it, but I knew this meditation thing was about a shift in consciousness. Okay, so then I also had this intuitive sense that it was something about going into the depths of consciousness. And that's where the secret lay. But it was all a bit of a mystery because it's all a bit dark and murky in there. <laughs> so I got the book on mindfulness and it wasn't really about that. It was about bringing your awareness into the senses, as you're saying. And I think I did talk about the present moment, but I agree that's a much more accurate way of saying it. So let's say into the senses. And to me, it felt like initially I thought, well, yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought to put it that way. But in these experiences, I was in the present moment. I wasn't thinking about the future and I wasn't worried about the past. All those concerns fell away and I was just enjoying loving being in my garden for the day with a real sense of peace but it felt like that was the result of a deeper cause and it felt like the as a way of getting back there the idea of no just bring your mind back to the present moment was was putting the cart before the horse to me but i was at a complete loss to say what that deeper thing was that had been the cause the cause was a mystery to me and that then led on I suppose that defined the next 10 years of my life, sort of uncovering the deeper cause then. So there's two aspects 
to your work in this way, right? Like the 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 sensing and the presencing. Maybe you want to say something about the presencing at this point, or the yes, the contrast. yeah. In, in my in my books, um, Deep Wake and and the Mystery Experience, I I call it entering and presencing because the you enter into the senses. Uh, that comes from a, a story, a Zen story, which people have heard me tell, I expect, many times, where a Zen master is asked, how can I become enlightened? And he, he just brings the student's attention to the sound of a babbling brook and says, enter there. And that's it. And that, that really intrigued me when I was in my 20s. And I would do that. I would enter. I, I happened to be living. I was, it was one of the long periods of meditation. I happened to have a little cottage by a babbling brook. So I would sit and enter there. And uh, it was... Uh, very transformative so there's that's this idea of entering but then there's a sinking back it's a paralogical thing for me it's not not it's really that the, the, the coming into the senses waking up to to what it is to sense is a wonderful thing in itself to just get the feeling of the breath or how beautiful it is to look at color uh, or um sound that's good in itself but it also allows the possibility of becoming conscious of, of being. So the phrase is, which is this presence, this presence that's witnessing this. So I call it entering and presencing. I'm actually in the process of beginning to start the la changing the language and just make it, I think, even clearer and just say, look, it's deep sensing and then deep being. You just concentrate on that sense of deep being, which is always there, which is not actually a sensation or a thought. It's, it's the witness. It's awareness itself. It's your deep being. So the process for me in, in deep weight meditation is we start in, in the psyche, usually, and we want to wake up to our, our depths. So you come right into the sensation in the moment and just really, what is it to listen or to look or to feel in your body, your breath? And then that will transform your consciousness very quickly. And it allows you then to then sink your awareness back so that you're conscious that you're conscious. You'll, you'll become conscious of that deep I am, that being which is always there, always there, whatever you're experiencing. Okay. I'd like to talk a bit about the positives and also the problems of just doing one of those poles. Okay, because that's where I feel mindfulness as a movement is at largely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my experience then for the next, like let's say three or four years after this awakening experience, getting into mindfulness, I have a high opinion of my own ideas usually. So I thought, no, I'll put the book down for I'm going to try going into consciousness, right? And, and see what that does. I'm sure I'm right. And the Zen masters are wrong here. So <laughs> anyway. um, and the result was I would usually like have these, these deep inner experiences of the creative hypnagogic parts of the mind. And then I'd fall asleep and I'd wake up and it wouldn't be very different. So I decided, okay, I, I'll, I will uh, submit and, and do things the way it was actually Eckhart Tolle that sold it to me right as he did like a hugely influential figure yeah. and he talked about coming into the senses as a way of getting back to that kind of oneness consciousness and i felt like yeah that's this guy knows what he's on about that's it right so the next several years of my life became this um i think quite arduous like gurdjieff type meditation of being in the senses the whole yeah. time um, and my um one of my teachers at the time was a, a gurdjieff man and um, so it's all about coming into the senses and, and all this, and, uh, there were benefits, right? Life got better in some ways, but also I felt like I'd replaced all my multitude of problems with this one big problem of coming into the senses with the idea that it would flick a switch and the enlightenment thing would go on and I'd get the deep consciousness again. And I have to say that that never happened, right? That, and it, it's puzzling to me or it's an interesting question to me i wonder if coming into the senses works differently for different people because i hear some people do it and they think it's it's a ro royal road to enlightenment i hear some people do it and it really helps them with a multitude of problems and i hear some people do it and they just find it quite a frustrating experience okay and i'm probably in the more well i sort of move between those categories really but i can i certainly know what it's like to relate to it as a frustrating experience okay and then i am um, I remember one morning I got up with the intention to meditate because that's what I did early in the mornings. I had a really poor night's sleep and I thought, you know, this is a wasted time here, right? I'm not going to get anywhere. I'm just going to fall asleep. I'll just take a nap for half an hour and I'll be better for the day. And I spontaneously entered into this place of 
being asleep but not being asleep, where I was this witnessing consciousness that was observing thoughts rising and attaching to them and then watching them fall. And I was this deep, peaceful, tranquil presence behind that. Okay. And that spontaneously opened up. And that, I suppose, then was like another step along the way then to, to going more into the, the presencing thing. So um, what are your thoughts on possibilities and potential pitfalls of just doing the presencing? Did, I mean, obviously you didn't, you were having these. You, you mean just doing the sensing? Yeah, you were having great experiences around the babbling brook and that kind of thing, but you didn't stick with it, right? You, you did more. So what, what drove you to do that? Where it's did you... never been ever for me just the one side. So that's why when I came to actually articulate it and start to write books and to want to frame how I would um, help guide people to the experiences I was exploring, it was always both ends. Um, because it's never been about just coming into the senses. Uh, always, that's been a vehicle to allow this deeper sense to open up. So there's all sorts of pitfalls with it. Um, one is, and, and, and I talk about this often when I talk about meditation, when I learned meditation, I learned lots of different meditations, but a lot of them were around the breath and things like that. Um, and so in a Buddhist context, particularly around mindfulness, it was often around the breath. And the, the teaching that was coming through at the time was very much the mind is the enemy. It's a problem. It's a bad thing. I get this sometimes from Eckhart, although he does say the opposite too, but a lot of people pick that up from him when they come to me. Time is a bad thing. The mind is a bad thing. Get into the present moment. Get away from that. If you could, everything would be fine. You'd be enlightened. The mind is not a bad thing. The mind is a fabulously beautiful thing. It's just a paralogical and ambivalent thing, like everything, like the body is. The body is a wonderful thing. It has a negative side. I've got flu. Uh, I'm still recovering. When you've got that, you see the other side of it. It can also cause immense suffering, of course. So everything's got that nature. <clears throat> so one of the pitfalls is it, it, you set up an impossible task, which is I need to just be in my senses and this will open up this amazing experience and that's not going to happen. So for me, it's always been about, look, let's wake up to everything and, and, and let's find the, the good in it all. So find the good in the senses, in the body, find the good in the mind. And then this, this deep being, which is the place of communion, of oneness and the source of the feeling of big love. The just getting stuck in coming out of in into the present or or into the senses can is actually debilitating and if it's not if there's not an understanding that that what it's wanting to do is open up much more ease to sink back then you miss out on the real point um you know i, I was intrigued when we when you suggested we had this conversation about mindfulness as the next deep awake um dialogue you mentioned researching the original meaning in the Tibetan of the word. I mean, maybe just say that because that, that was really yeah. what was on my mind. Um, so the, the Sanskrit is, um, I forget the word, uh, but it, it means retention in some way. And it, it, after you go back far enough, it starts to mean retention of the, um, the sacred scriptures because that's what they have diverse religious um, opinions over there as much as we do. So just as for some people here, spirituality is all about learning the Bible and for some people it's about being in the moment. It's, it's the same in India and we, um, with their scriptures and we pick up on the bit we like, but the Tibetan word is gom. That's which the one to bring awareness to one's Buddha nature. Yes. Very different to saying to bring awareness to one's breath. So there you get it. There you get it. This is why I was so fascinated when you, when you brought that up, the, 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 the point is, to bring awareness to your Buddha nature. Well, what is your Buddha nature? Well, the Buddha is the knower. So it's your knower nature. The same with the, in the, the Gnostic tradition, the Gnosis, the Gnana is knowing the knower, which means knowing being, the thing which has no form, which is conscious of all form. Now, the issue with that is that for most people, when you start this process and you go, okay, be conscious of your being that has no form, it just sounds crazy. Because you, we start from consciousness of the most obvious, I'm my body. <clears throat> When we get beyond that, we can go, oh, no, I have a body. I'm my psyche. I'm my soul. And when you, it's only the next step where you go, oh, I'm the, this deep presence, which is one with everything, witnessing Tim, body and soul. So to get straight there is quite difficult. So what the, all these forms of meditation I feel in their depths are about is this process of going, okay, so you've got a way of seeing what reality is and it's created by your concepts. That's necessary, but limiting. So for a moment, just come out and come into your senses. And now that you've just shifted your perspective, you're out of that bubble. Now 
just be conscious that you are or that you are conscious and so the deep meaning of mindfulness is your mindful is means that i'm not just having this conversation i'm not just conscious i'm talking to richard i'm conscious that i'm conscious of talking to richard mm. and it's that extra jumping back that the, the the mindfulness really is and that's much deeper than just paying attention to the to the senses okay to start to uh, come to a close i'd like to talk about mystical experience a bit and transcendent experiences so the next kind of stage of life for me then investigating this was at some point i came to your workshops again i'd been previously a few about 2004 time and to address issues very much like the ones we covered in the myth of enlightenment dialogue and, and getting out of that kind of perspective and then i i'd come back for entirely other reasons really i'd um it's i'll, I'll tell this story maybe in a, a future dialogue about um, my attending an alpha course the christian conversion course and i was enjoying it and enjoyed the dialogue and i thought you know he'll be a good man to talk to this about tim freak i'll go see him again uh, and then i got kind of wrapped up in in a lot of there was a lot of energy around your group at the time and, and still is i suppose but um and i was really enjoying the um the the talks you were doing and the workshops but i wasn't really looking for mystical experience i'd had this very transcendent classical experience a couple of years prior to that of going through a depressive episode and then coming to the center of my being and dissolving into it and it opening up into this infinite oceanic sense of love kind of thing like seeing the mind of the dreamer beyond the veil of the universe and it was totally transformational for me and i was living my life with an awareness that that was there somewhere in the background but i wasn't seeking to get back there and what happened was that one of the the deep awakening events or the mystery experiences they were called then this experience opened up again and that really took me by surprise because it's not something that opened up when i was sat at home on my sofa meditating so that was a real puzzle for me like what's the difference okay and i don't think it's just being surrounded by nice people also doing it. i don't i in my mind it didn't make sense to say it was a group effect so i spent about a year then trying to figure out why quite consistently for me this transcendent non-dual oneness infinite love experience would open up through doing the kind of meditations at your groups and the the penny dropping thing for me was it was kind of a completion of the the journey i'd started 10 years before was the, the nature of the meditation you do is very much getting people to look outwards and connect with another person so the senses are moving out right into the material phenomenal world but then you with your words are guiding people backwards into the depths of consciousness so there's this like stretching out process going on where you're moving deeper into both poles of being okay and what i found was that to bring it back to the start of my story the the, the problem i'd had where i would kept falling asleep was if you just go into awareness that's what happens because awareness without something to be aware of is unaware it's just a blank it's deep sleep essentially yeah so the way uh, you put it which really um, made the penny drop for me was to to talk about an, the need to maintain some awareness in the phenomenal world so awareness can become aware of itself and you can experience effectively the deep sleep state but in a wakeful way and that's what started opening up in me and when i became uh, when i realized that's what it was i was able then to integrate that into life and have this sinking back into this consciousness which kind of naturally leads to being more quote unquote mindful being more in the senses in the moment because that's where awareness awareness tends to balance itself out when it's three or so different aspects are, are all given attention to the, the body the mind and the spirit so i'll put it over to you what's your experience then of the, the deeper kind of transcendent realities that open up from going into the depths of consciousness wow that was so great to hear richard you put it so clearly as well uh, i completely um get that i can see the, I, I, that's ex that's exactly my experience i'm so pleased to hear you say it so so that that everything is, this is where the paralogical philosophy has come from not as just some abstract thing but as something concrete that transforms consciousness so the depths of that for me is you know into the individual be conscious of the oneness they both come together but in the meditation practice that becomes enter the the sense the sensual world of the body 
and then sink into the non-dual formless essence. And you're right. If you just enter the senses, which we were talking about earlier, and you could, it, it leads nowhere, actually. It's kind of interesting and beautiful for a while, but you will exhaust it. And one of the reasons we don't just live in the senses is it exhausts itself eventually. If you then just try and enter the, if, even if you can, lots of people just can't, but if you have the sensitivity to, to, dis, to be conscious of your, of your depths of awareness straight off, uh, and try and push the rest away where you will fall asleep because the, the fundamental oneness awareness in a state of oneness is unconscious because it's on everything it's pure potentiality it, it it's being with no nothing in it with no becoming so it's it has no qualities and therefore it is on everything including unconscious so it needs to have something to be conscious of hence the reason we're conscious right now so then in the meditation becomes allowing once you've found that deep space that you can keep something which you're conscious of so that you've got you, you're, you're you're individual and conscious of these depths which as you rightfully say we dissolve into in deep sleep mm. so the deep sleep state is, is beautiful and oceanic isn't it and wonderful and refreshing you can kind of remember it when you come back i mean you don't not at the time but you're not there then and the the great mystery which you just pointed to so beautifully is that that oceanic warm all embracing oneness and these are adjectives that i'm using they're just kind of you know the way it makes me feel that's there now it's always there which is why when we when it's appropriate and it's not always appropriate but when it is appropriate to dive deeply into that when there's enough safety that you can dissolve your attention into it either individually in meditation or like happens what happens at a deep awakening where we can do it all together what opens up is that suddenly you've you know people have gone from their rigidity to this mm, very and it's very sensual and it's very emotionally it's very warm and, and inclusive and there's this deep peace this almost like a behind everything and that's that's always there so one of the great insights for me with all of this was oh these three states i move between of waking dreaming and deep sleep which we all move they're always present right now right now the waking state is it's the waking state because there's sensation it's the dreaming state because there's imagination and it's the deep sleep state because i'm conscious of being and the deep awake is to come out of just being numb or superficially aware of any of them and like you said to stretch my consciousness so i can move my attention wherever it needs to be i can come right into my mind which is where we need to be a lot of the time because that's where most of us function but i don't forget that i can just come out into my senses and i can sink back into that whoa that's deep peace and the fluidity to do that and one of the one of the problems i see with a lot of mindfulness teaching which can arise is it becomes like in the gurdjieff tradition which is very much that it becomes like you should be in this all the time i'm i am noticing tim speaking to richard i am noticing tim scratching his nose i am noticing tim breathing and it's like man who'd want to live like that yeah yeah well actually um i think you were, it's on the you did a documentary called who's driving the dream boss yes and is it genpo roche is that the name of the zen fellow on yes there? so one of the things he says on there is at the zen center they would do the meditation all week long and then go out and get horrendously drunk on the friday night and he yeah. felt it was consciously resetting itself and it's it's kind of an interesting image to think of like zen monks doing that but it was also my experience that i've never drunk so much in my life as when i was doing <laughs> a lot of mindfulness stuff and i do think it's like a release from being pushed the pushing the mind into 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 the senses Okay, yeah no. or, or, or 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 back and back and back both actually you know what what we what we what we need to do is get rid of the idea that there's something wrong in there's lots of things wrong obviously but there's that the, 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 there's some fundamental bad thing like the mind or um well usually the mind the ego whatever it is that's trapping us and rather see that what we want is to bring everything into harmonious balance and it's balance in movement it's not like mm, it's 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 more like running and, and the more balance you've got the faster you can run not yeah. stopping everything now you slow it right down in meditation and when you practice mindfulness you know the best way you know to walk around the garden being mindful what a lovely thing to do the slower you go i get people at the, at the deep awakening retreats to just move their body really slowly 
and just become conscious of it and enter in. It's beautiful. I love to do that in the mornings. But I, I'm not going to walk around the whole day like that because I want, I'm doing that to wake me up and then I want to move, flow with it and let my attention go where it needs to go so that then it becomes about liberation, to use a classical word, freedom, rather than some permanent thing which you, which you, you find by getting rid of some of the things which are in the way of it. Um, and that can be some of the problems of these, these other approaches to mindfulness and meditation, which I've myself got involved in when I was much, much younger. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for all that, Tim. Um, is there anything else you want to say on the subject? I feel like we should end on a positive note. That's yeah. for sure, because I've just yeah. been critical of other things. And, you know, that's, I guess, my, my whole um, message, from the, the paralogical message, is that I end up, being willingly critical of wherever I see one pole without the other, because I think how we're doing both is so important. So for me, the positive side of the message is always, look, there will be always these two poles that we need to embrace, the both, not either or. And with the meditation, this means being able to really come into our separateness, our individuality, which is sensation, is definitely that. And then right back to this profound stillness and oneness and formlessness. And I think you said this again when we, we, we discussed the other day about doing this dialogue. You said, when I come into the senses, this tends to open up anyway. You mm -hmm. don't see them as separate. And that's a sign for me of, of a maturity of understanding of meditation. Because it's like that for me also now, after many, many years, whereby you start seeing that it's not really two movements, it's one movement by expanding in you by becoming conscious of, of sensation you almost can't help but become conscious that you're conscious yeah so then oh there's that and if you wake up to these depths suddenly you appreciate there's this love so you're loving the sensation so rather than it just being looking at the colors in front of me it's like wow these the, the, how extraordinary is sound how and there's a sensitivity that arises because I'm not numb in the same way. Yeah. But these two things are the same thing. They're two and one at the same time. And, and if, if we can bring those two together, then I think you have a very, very simple and powerful way to transform consciousness. And sometimes it concerns me at my deep awakenings because I'm not a traditional meditation teacher because I don't sit people down and go, okay, this is the technique, learn this and then do it every day because I'm much more like, look, find your way through with these principles that people miss how practical the things I'm teaching are and the things in Deep Awake book, for instance, how practical these are, that they are something you can really, if you get it, you could, by simply entering and presencing or deep sensing and deep being, you can develop the facility to become conscious of these uh, of what you are and what life is in a much deeper way. And then the same with the, with the gazing and the listening or the, the soul to soul connection. These are intensely practical techniques. You, we can do it now, you know, as you well know. So I could be conscious. I'm talking to Richard, but also I'm talking to God. I'm talking to the universe itself speaking back to me. And it's all to do with all of these um, practices. It's to do with what you do with your attention. And once you get that, then you're in a whole new game. And it's not like you were describing when you were younger and it was same for me. Oh, this heavy weight you've got to carry and I'm failing. Mm, yeah. It becomes a play. Yeah. It becomes, wow, I can explore this. And the minute you remember, you can apply it. It doesn't matter how long you forgot for. What matters is that when you remember, you go, oh, I'll just do that. And you feel the change. And the more you do it in the past, the easier it becomes to do it in the future. Simple as that, because we're, we're made of our past experience. So the more, the deeper we've gone and the more we've done it, the easier it becomes generally. Not every day. Sometimes it's hard. When you've got flu, it's not so easy sometimes. So, but, that, but it will become again. Yeah, I, I'd like to end on a positive note too, really, because I, I, the last thing I want to do is for this dialogue to come across as like a kind of one-upmanship on mindfulness or anyone teaching mindfulness. It, it's not that, as I know, a lot of mindfulness teachers who feel a bit restricted sometimes because they've gone deeper themselves into these kind of things but then want to find a way to bring it through to people but feel the most practical thing they can do is stick with the meditation on the senses so i think our desire in doing this was to to open that door to mindfulness as a kind of gateway drug right to a bit of a deeper experience 
of these. Um... I think that's that's exactly right, Richard. We want what's happening, and why we should be incredibly grateful. I think to what's happened with the mindfulness movement, and and as, how astonishing it is. Let's just take a moment to just go, "Wow, that yeah. happened! I can't believe it." Yeah. Because when I was doing mindfulness, it was a tiny fringe, yeah. crazy place. Is that if you take out this deeper essence, or you you put it under the covers? which is what's happening generally with, with popular spirituality. It's like, take the really deep stuff, but, and then give, give stuff you can get easily. Come into your senses. Got it. Anyone can do that. You, you are truly formless being. Well, that's just weird. What the hell does that mean? You know, it's much harder to even talk about. But that's an ancient tradition. You know, you, you have studied my work on Gnosticism, and you know it well. And one of the things in the ancient world was outer mysteries and inner mysteries. And, and there is a tradition always of, here's an easier entry point. And then when you're ready, you yes. will naturally start going, well, where's the deeper thing then? Surely that this is, I'm, I, this is pointing to something deeper. And that's the other, the other side. Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay. Um, thank you for listening to this. And I'll link to both our websites below. Tim will be doing events in the real world around these kind of themes. Tim also does online events. On these kind of themes so check those out and i do similarly real real world and and online too so yeah check out um, and there's writing and, and meditations on on these kind of themes tim thanks very much and uh, i look forward to talking to you again likewise fantastic